We are. Hold on, setting up your webinar for Facebook Live. We are, yeah, we are live. Okay, good evening, everybody. It's Kevin here uh, with another Awake Sleep Apnea Facebook Live event using Zoom. It's my pleasure here tonight to welcome again Adam Amder, who many of you know. And um, I've also got uh, Dr. Carl Stepanowski. I'm hoping I pronounced that correctly. Yep. Um, he is a research psychologist who specializes in behavioral sleep medicine. And he saw a need to apply a behavioral science approach to sleep apnea diagnosis and management, given that sleep apnea is a chronic disease, disease sorry, that needs to be managed over time. He had been the principal investigator and co-investigator on multiple research grants with funding from the VA, AHRQ, NIH, and PCORI, among many others. Suffering from insomnia himself from high school and his first year of college, he changed his sleep habits during his sophomore year after talking to Dr. Mary Kirk Kirksedon, yeah, or taking her course actually in uh, psychophysiology of sleepy, sleep and dreams. And just by changing his bedtime, uptime and sleep duration, his brain immediately went from forgetful to sticky and grades went from straight C's to straight A's. <laughs> With the increase in age and weight, he was diagnosed with mild sleep apnea and now manages both his insomnia and sleep apnea. Well, welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. So I guess the whole um, idea for tonight is um, I talked to Adam last night. I'm sure a lot of the people are coming from a down after the um, very successful awake sleep apnea meeting. Um, I just wanted to start with you, Adam, and just sort of touch on some of the highlights for you from the, from the meeting. And we can't hear you. Can't hear you. <laughs> there you go. Can you, can you hear me now? I can hear you. The, the highlights for the meeting were, for me, were, were, were still on cloud nine um, three weeks later. Uh, we had our meeting June 28th, and today's June 27th, so we're literally almost 21 days later. Um, and, you know, the, the amount of new people, the amount of new energy that the organization has, has found, uh, the amount of opportunities that we're helping clear our focus on uh, has gotten much more within our, within our grasp and within our, within our abilities to understand where we are as an organization and what our role is to do. Um, Coming off of this survey is it's it's it definitely knocked me off my feet physically and mentally uh, in this meeting, but it's definitely uh, it's reinvigorated us and I think given us a lot of energy and momentum uh, as we finish out our fiscal year in this last week uh, to start the next year uh, off with gangbuster start. Now you're talking to the mute, Kevin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can't hear you. Can you hear now me now? There we what go. is now going on tonight? I'm sorry. <laughs> so, Bill, yeah, I wanted to just um, hear about your participation in the meeting and um, what sort of discussions did you have? Yeah, I thought it was a phenomenal meeting. The We've always been aware of the, of the patient stories, but to have them front and center highlighted by the 10 panelists that we had, I thought was just uh, in, incredible. Um, it really helps remind all of us about the whole point of, of healthcare, which is to, to serve patients. And um, that's why I look forward to talking more about it in, in this webinar. Um, I think the thing that struck me the most was just to hear the phenomenal stories and some of the major challenges that each of the panelists had, whether it was time to recognition of the problem, to challenges within the healthcare system to get initially diagnosed, to challenges to getting the right therapy, to maintaining the right therapy over time. Um, each person had a, a story and, and they're just tremendously powerful. We as an organization have, have tried to pull these stories out, but I think to highlight them within that context, the context was to help inform FDA, but in doing helping to inform FDA, we're really helping to inform everybody, so. Sure, that's great. And I mean, I think a lot of people get a great benefit from hearing firsthand stories from people that they can identify with. And 
certainly when I watch some of the highlights on the patient panelists, you know, their stories were, were quite inspiring as well. And, you know, you realize how, how people struggle through this. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, this is why we, we want it out there so people can um, help get the treatment they need. Absolutely. Any, um, I know the, the survey was quite successful, Adam. I, I think it, we're now at about, what, 5,500 respondents? Yeah, I got a funny feeling we'll be, we're going to be able to say over 6,000 by the end of this week. Uh, we're pretty close to that with some of our partners uh, making a last-minute push. So uh, we're right now north of 5,500, but we, we think uh, with a few other things we're waiting on that we'll be able to hit that six number by the end of the week. So we'll see. Great. <laughs> but, and but, but Carl me. can speak to that much better as a PhD yeah. than I can. <laughs> yeah, no. We work together. <laughs> no. When does the survey close? Uh, June 29th, uh, but we're also, you know, expecting a, a major news story to break. So uh, we think if that happens while the survey is still open, we'll leave it open uh, so that people get an opportunity to still take the survey if, if they hadn't seen it yet. Okay. So and then results will be posted where? Carl, you want to speak to that or looks like we got well you froze? We'll do uh, we'll do two things. We'll have a report that we uh, that ge we generate, and then we'll also write up a, a manuscript and submit it to a scientific publication. But um, we'll we'll post it on our on our homepage. I think right, Adam at, at sleepapnea.org. It'll be at sleepapnea.org, and it'll be on our microsite, the Awake Sleep where you, where you can watch the replay of the meeting right now. Uh, and if you don't want to watch the meeting in its replay right now, you could also go to our YouTube channel and watch it segmented out. Yeah. for each piece of the, the panel that we had. Great. And Carol, just another question regarding the meeting. What was the main learning opportunity for your takeaway message? The main take takeaway message? Um, you know, I kind of summarized at, at the end of the meeting and, and said I had, I had gotten interested in the entire field in my dissertation, attending my first awake group about 22 years ago. And no. this, this kind of represented the next big national awake meeting. And what I thought was so much has changed in 22 years, but unfortunately, so much is the same. And, and by that, I mean, I went out 22 years ago and, and followed folks into their homes to see how the DME set folks up. And even though we have some amazing, amazing clinicians and amazing DMEs, there are still some challenges within the healthcare system that I think still needs to be improved. And so while a lot has, has, has improved over that amount of time, I think there's still a lot of improvement. So I think that was one of the, the main takeaways. Unfortunately, I think what we've seen with the sleep medicine business is that it's gotten uh, quite big um, but it's actually starting to retract a little bit in terms of the number of fellowships for MDs and, and the number of um, uh, programs that are in place. And um, there's still a large undiagnosed population that we need to serve. And so there's some really structural problems, I think, with the practice of, of sleep medicine that we hope to, to start to address. Great. Anything to add to that, Adam? Yeah, to me, what it, it, I wasn't as nearly surprised by the panelists because I know we had a, a, a big say in who they would be, so we, I, I knew their stories, a lot of them. But I was just so proud and impressed at how well they all delivered their story. They were calm. They weren't emotional. Um, you know, they were worried they weren't going to have enough time, but they had enough time not only during their panel, but also during the meeting to ask questions. And even if they forgot about something, to bring it up. Um, I was most impressed by the response from, from the FDA regulators, from the device and from the farmer side, how much they appeared to really absorb and take it in and, and get something out of the day. It wasn't just another meeting. Uh, you could see that they weren't on their phones, that they were engaged and, you know, were, were, were eating it up uh, because they were getting, you know, the good, the bad and the ugly and everything in between. And, you know, they, it, they had a lot more complete picture at the end of that day than I think they had in a long time before that. Mm -hmm. So on that note, do you feel what's any insight from what the FDA plan on doing with the information or, or you know, their experience during the meeting? 
Well, from Carl's standpoint, you know, we're, we're going to publish a report and then on, on the meeting, which will include the, the transcript, the survey results, the real-time polling results. Um, and we think they'll like it enough that they'll host it on their FDA website. Um, but the real, the real value is, is that, you know, when we'll know that we've made a difference is that when we become the go-to source, uh, when they're looking at a lot of different products for both device and farm, when they really value our opinion, uh, and not just, you know, asking for a yes from us. Uh, they really want to know if we think this is going to help or not. And I think that this meeting has sort of given us, you know, the, the credibility or the integrity to, to know that we have the moral compass to point north to, to tell them the way it is, uh, good, bad, or indifferent. And I think that's, for me, the, the biggest thing coming out of that meeting. Yeah, I don't know if I lost if I lost my my train of thought there, but I'm sure I did. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I totally agree. I mean, FDA was great. I mean, the the whole point of of this series of meetings that they learn more about the the conditions, and I thought uh, they, Adam, I totally agree. They were there with open ears, and they were really hearing about the experiences that folks had. Our understanding is that there's about 197 different sleep apnea therapies and and uh, interventions that have been approved by FDA over the years. And I think they really are hearing that, that um, to the extent that there can be more and better in innovation for sleep apnea patients, that's what the community wants and, and needs. We mm -hmm. really need CPAP for all that it can do. And for those who get a positive response, it's, it's been a tremendous uh, improvement in, in their lives. But for a lot of people with mild and moderate, it's almost perceived as, as too much therapy for some folks. So anything that can help them improve their lives and reduce their cardiovascular risk um, is, is much needed. And I think FDA has, has open ears on that. Sure. Yeah, not, not, not only did they have open ears on that, but even with the severe cases who are 100% compliant like me, they still realize, okay, we're treating the breeding, we're treating the obstruction, but we still might have a problem with the sleep because I'm still presenting with excessive daytime sleepiness and, and I'm as compliant as there is. So there's still an issue here that's unresolved in all our lives. Now, whether it's a long-term effect from burning through my adrenals, uh, whereas children present differently because they still have theirs, uh, it's to be determined. So, you know, it's the, 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 the therapy is giving us a way to manage our disease now and giving us back a lot of quality of life. So there's no doubt that the benefits outweigh the risk. Uh, the, the question is, is as the innovation stopped, is there, is there incentive to keep the innovation going? Uh, is there incentive to get the early recognition in, into the preventive part of this, this makeup? And these are all the things that, you know, as we outlined in the, in the, in the thematic theme of, of the meeting and when the different panelist stories and their different outcomes and with our report, it, it's obvious that we have to help a lot of people at a lot of different major bottleneck and infringement points, uh, pre-diagnosis, uh, many, many years, if not decades before, up to diagnosis through the clinical uh, maze and, and through the DME world out on the other end to where that, you know, it's, 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 this is something that we're going to have to live with the rest of our life and we need to learn how to manage. So anything we can do to help improve and r remove the barriers and get frictionless and make this where it's like Rick Gordon, uh, one of our past board members who was one of the panelists said on, on, on our meeting is like, it's, it's just like putting on your glasses. You know you need them every morning when you wake up to see, and it's the last thing you take off before you go to the bed. Well, for sleep apnea, and in our case, for people on pap theory, it's the reverse. It's you put on your mask, it's the last thing you do, and it's the first thing you take off when you wake up in the morning. Hopefully, you've done it right the whole night. Um, so, Yeah. I'd like to pick up on, on one, one point you made, Adam, which is um, it's sleep apnea or sleep-disordered breathing. So just because we treat the breathing at night doesn't yeah. mean that the sleep has improved. Oftentimes it has, but not for everybody. Even in what's called compliant cases, there can still be residual problems with, with sleep and sleep quality, which bleeds over into, into sleepiness the next day. And yeah, I'm, I'm, having a, I'm having a hard time looking at myself on the camera, Carl, because I can see how bad the black bags under my eyes. <laughs> so, so I know between the red tide and the allergies outside that, you know, yeah. Thank God I'm sleeping, but it's I can see it's it's showing on my face right now, or maybe that's the HD. Who knows? And, and, and <laughs> you have some of the best CPAP numbers around. <laughs> right. <laughs> and that's it's scary looking at myself. I don't like looking at myself, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I think, you know, a lot of times when we do talk to the people out there in our communities, the compliance, adherence, or, you know, just getting used to the therapy is huge. 
I mean, do you feel there's anything new coming down the pipeline for people that are struggling with um, obstructive sleep apnea? I think with children, I'm excited because I see it firsthand with my daughter, who's, you know, our N of one case every day. And, you know, she's uh, about three or four days into her summer camp experience for a third year in a row. And luckily, I get to look and, and be a voyeur with her mother and look at the pictures every day. And now they're even using Facebook Live so I can see them in real time. Uh, I see my child thriving and, and, and she's thriving for one reason. We caught it early. We've introduced a multidisciplinary intervention. We did a surgical intervention. We did a, uh, uh, an orthodontic intervention that we've, we've maintained all the way for the last eight years. We've looked at her food inflammation. We looked at environmental. Bottom line is she's, she's the tallest girl in her class. You can see it in the pictures. So she's, the growth hormone is there, which means it's a good indication that the sleep is right. She, her immune system is very strong. She's rarely ever getting sick. Her grade levels are, are through the roof. Her temperament is even, uh, she has to put up with me, which I wouldn't wish on anybody in this world. <laughs> uh, but, and she still seems not to be affected by it. Um, and so the truth is when, when, when my child's not the exception and when she's the rule, then I know that from a preventive standpoint, the ASAA and sleepapnea.org, we've done our job. Uh, are there a lot of other ways to refine our therapies? Yeah, I mean, for instance, just going to the sleep conference, I was able to walk around and check out all the manufacturers and check out the sample mask. And, and there's in, the, the, the innovation that's happening in the mask world is getting better. There's no doubt. I, you know, the last month that I've been home after this meeting, my, my numbers are as good as they've ever been, and the leaking is way down. Um, so, you know, that's, that's totally attributed because I only changed one factor. That was my mask. So at each month, I'll try a different one and see if I see a difference. So there, there are improvements being made, but they're so subtle and incremental that it's just not good enough for the majority of the public. I don't know if, Carl, you want to speak to that? or Yeah, I mean, you know, the great thing about CPAP is it, it's, it's such a simple therapy, and it's so effective when it's worn at the right pressure for the right amount of time, and there's minimal leak. Um, but I think for a lot of, and there is this in, incremental um, progress that we're seeing with CPAP therapy, but I think people, you know, there's, there's subgroups that want, want different kinds of therapies. And I think those are, are being, being developed now. Um, I, I got to echo Adam's point on prevention, though, prevention and, and treatment early and yeah. then for adults, um, too. So for example, oral myofunctional therapy. I mean, to think yep. about a daytime therapy where you do exercises that can reduce the number of events that you have at night while you're asleep without having to wear a device is, is pretty exciting. Um, so, you know, I think there's other things we need to start to look at and, and get into and, practice. And to give a good, perfect back to a case, case example, my, my, my daughter is, you know, she's now 10 years old. We've never been able to really do the, the oral myofunctional because it's, it's a conscious thing that you have to do. It's basically tongue exercises for a certain amount of time every day. And it's, it's a repeated uh, pattern. And, and, you know, we're, as all Americans, you know, most of us, you know, it's hard enough to brush our teeth twice a day. Uh, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't want to do oral myofunctional therapy. <laughs> But for a 10-year-old now who got her rapid palato expander out of her mouth and was wearing a, an ortho, an, an, um, a retainer now, she's like, oh, Dad, I, you know, I started putting my tongue up to the top of my mouth. And I'm like, great. The more you do that, the better chance you have of not wearing that mask as you go through puberty. So I, as a 10-year-old, she's already conscious of that she, there's things that she can do to improve her outcomes already that are so subtle that we wouldn't even know it's happening. Right. So. Yeah, and I think it's a, it's important to put it out there that there are adjunct therapies as well that'll help, you know, whether it's, yeah. you know, even dropping some weight or, you know, the exercise you speak of, it, it's all contributing to your, your health in a way. Yeah, the, the weight is 100% a key factor regardless of whether you have it or you don't have it. I mean, even if you've had a lot of weight and you've lost it, the, the tongue still hasn't lost the fat, but you got to got to help keep the weight down regardless to have any sort of major improvements. I mean, Carl can speak to the numbers on that way better than I can, but it's, it's, it's a, it's, it's not, people don't want to do it, but it's something yeah. we need to do. Yeah. I, I think we should have a separate webinar just on, on that because I think yeah. there's always lip service paid to, to weight and exercise, but for sleep apnea, some of the meta analyses that are coming up are showing that you're, we're able to drop the number of events at night by half just by exercise and weight management alone without the need for any sort of device. 
And I think that's underappreciated. And I'm trained as a, as, a, as a behavioral medicine specialist. So I get how hard behavior <laughs> changes for folks. But sometimes when you understand what the, all the implications are, and if you know, if someone knows the trajectory that they're on, especially middle-aged, when that, that incremental um, weight increase is, is happening, you can spend a little bit extra time focusing on, on that. So um, that's motivation, you know? And I, I think if people, what, what we always wanted to do is create, you know, it was always um, um, the creating sleep or sleep apnea as a vital sign that is asked about yeah. every single time you go in. That's not happening. And it should be happening because if people understood the incremental nature of it, it comes on slowly over time. So when we heard some of the stories, you know, all of a sudden you wake up one day and you had an accident in the middle of the day. Well, that started happening a couple of years ago or maybe 10 years ago. And if people understood how that happens incrementally over time and start to catch it early, I think that's one of the important things that happens during adulthood. Now, as this morning, I was at a grand rounds at UCSD and, and the CEO was there and it was a general internal medicine crowd. And I mean, you know, we can't expect our, our, our family practitioners and our general internal medicine practitioners are overwhelmed. They're getting squeezed from all sides. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to ask them to ask about one more thing, but with the importance of sleep, I don't know how they can't ask about it. I just don't know how they can't ask about sleep. It's just so important. Sure, and I mean, I think getting it out there so it just becomes, you know, the natural thing to ask. Um, and, and as part of a, a patient evaluation is great because some people just say, well, you know, I sleep okay or, you know, I'm tired all the time. But it's then what you do with that information then is 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 key, isn't it, to to maybe detection and, and help. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I would I would say that to, 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 to sort of amplify that it's it's not only is it the detection and the early prevention, but it's, you know, one thing FDA heard at the meeting is, is this is not a soft disease. This is a deadly, deadly disease, whether it's car accident, whether it's someone running a nuclear facility, uh, no matter what it is, it's effect, it affects all of us directly or indirectly one way or another, because we're all out walking around in, in this world with, with a lot of zombies, quite frankly. Um, and, and with, with that, I don't want I can't say with that being said, I'm not allowed to say that anymore. <laughs> um, Go no, on. Yeah, I lost my <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'll, I'll, Adam, I'll, I'll pick up on that thought because uh, as a grant writer, as a clinician, sleep apnea only became a quote unquote real disease when it was associated with hard outcomes, whether it was right. mortality, yeah. diabetes, cardiovascular disease. Yeah. What we heard on the panelists, and this is what I did in, in, the, in the summary for the, for the meeting, was once you hear these panelists talk, once you hear the, the real life stories about sleep apnea and its effect on family, it's the effect on how irritable folks are, the effect on work um, performance and sometimes getting fired from, from employment, from car accidents to empl employment accidents. I mean, these are really hard outcomes that are really affecting people's lives every single day and they're completely underappreciated. And so it, it goes back to the early thing. We mentioned it in the meeting, but you know, it's, and we saw it at the sleep meeting earlier with, 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 the, with the sleep doctors is this, this is not something that it needs to be a sort of, it's become reactionary. It's a lot of things have to happen before the sleep apnea has ever really realized that that's sort of the culprit in the room or a major factor in what's going on in that person's life. So this, this idea and this notion of education and sleep health as a prevention and just as a mindset, we've gotten up to speed on nutrition. We're getting up to speed on movement. Sleep is no doubt the third pillar of this, of this wellness thing. The question is, is what kind of sleep and, and what and how much sleep. So yeah, you have a lot of conversations about the quantity and, and we, we've, you know, the, the quantity is important, no doubt, but you know, it's the quality that's really the, 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 the more important on top of it. And they really go hand in hand in, in, in most cases, but <laughs> back to my favorite line with that being said, um, <laughs> um, it's, it's at, at the end of the day, when sleep deprivation is taught as a badge of honor, we're already we're already swimming very hard upstream. The cha the changing that mentality and getting sleep into the edu into the elementary, the junior high, into those levels where people value it 
earlier before they ever get to college. It's, I think it's going to be key for all of society, especially with this kind of technology that we all have walking around in our hands every day. Well, here, here's a here's a great one. About three years ago, on the opening keynote for the uh, uh, annual sleep meeting, there, there is a question posed to about two thousand sleep professionals: How many hours of sleep did you get the night before? And something like seventy percent got less than five hours of sleep. Oh wow! <laughs> so, if sleep professionals can't prioritize sleep, who can, right? <laughs> yeah. No, and I think. I can honestly say that given my experiences from a, a young age, I mean, 10 to six, I mean, there's so much research coming out now about why sleep's important, not just because it used to be that sleep, you, you, you could in, you would incur a sleep debt and, you know, you have to you pay it off. But what we're finding is sleep is important on a daily basis. You need to get a certain amount of sleep for 24 hours on a regular basis. If you don't get it, you're not making it up. That, that slow incremental damage accumulates over time. And I think that's one of the messages that as we learn more about the, the function of sleep and the importance of sleep, we'll, we'll get out to, to the public. 10 years ago, I mean, probably, yeah, 10 years ago, I can honestly say, I don't think we could talk, sit here and talk about the, why sleep was important from a physiological point of view. Today, we can talk about that. We can talk about the glymphatic system. We can talk about removal of the toxins from the brain during sleep. We can talk about um, memory consolidation. We can talk about all the importance of it. Adam and, I, Adam and I were blown away, right? When we were heard from the NCI guy, National Cancer Institute. I, as a sleep professional, I should have known that shift work was a known carcinogen. I did not know that. That's, that's been on the cancer list of carcinogens for eight, eight years now. Yeah, yeah that. That blew me away. I mean, Kevin, I mean, we, we, we met, what, how many years ago? 16, 18 years ago? Yeah, you were yeah. working. You were working. I remember you working all-nighters on the National Transplant or the California Transplant yeah. team and, and getting in a car. And I, I remember you telling me. I don't remember how I got home. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, you know, it's important for people to know that too. And I think they've made the association with that and shift work and sleep deprivation and the bouncing back and forth from daytime routines to nighttime shift work um, but also you know the the you know correlation with like just that light pollution that people are in these environments too um, it just doesn't help either right so it's no. great it's been looked at um, don't know if there's going to be a solution to that but mm -hmm. uh, I think people need to be mindful of it <laughs> Adapt adaptability yeah, change jobs. <laughs> so what do you feel is next? I mean, are these meetings going to be held on an annual basis? Or um, is that is that the feedback that you've got that people would like to have an annual meeting? I, I think I think the patients that were in the room and the patients that were online were are chomping at the bit to tell their stories. I know we all have like similar stories and they're all different in their in their in their in each little aspect, but I think having a national, whether it's a virtual awake meeting or re or regional ones, is definitely something that we're going to be looking at and putting on our roadmap. Um, you know, it, it takes it takes funders to put this kind of stuff on, but you know, we we, we maximize the time and, and the people that we had in the room, and you know, we we we've, you saw Jill's Friedman, the founder of Acor and Smart Patients, who did patient portraits. We were doing those all day, so we have more portraits to print. Uh, we were doing patient to patient interviews down in, in the lower ballroom. Uh, so we have a lot of stories to get out that are that are not just paternal and maternal talking down to us. They're patients talking to each other, having conversations about what life was like before and after. Um, so there, there's a lot of interesting things. You know, we're we're in J the end of June, and the, us as an organization has a, sort of a month to breathe and start to build up and get ready for our sleep timber this year. And I think we'll have a lot more participation with not only the partners and the groups that were at the Awake Sleep Apnea Initiative, uh, but some of our older sleep timber partners. And uh, partners that were part of Picori uh, and Picornet, so I, I could see us doing a lot more stuff this year. You know, I, I wish we knew what our viral thing was for Sleep Timber. Uh, last year we tried bedheads in the middle of, of two hurricanes, so that necessarily didn't have the best <laughs> success. But we will try again this year. I don't know what it'll be, um, but that's definitely to be determined in the next month or so as we pilot out a few things. So. 
that's sort of on my radar. I think Carl will speak to, you know, we still have our ongoing sleep health study and, and we're working, we're over two years on that and we're working on the next iteration, not only for the iOS platform, but for an Android and for a web-based platform. So we have a lot to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But having the patient focused meetings, I think could be really good going forward because it's an, it's a, it's an opportunity to hear from the community, what their challenges are, what's going well, uh, but what really what's not going well, where can we have a role, whether it's with, um, with the, the clinicians and, and some of the, the professional organizations, whether it's with driving some of the research in, in terms of, I, I did a, a lit search on cure for sleep apnea. I think I found two articles that were loosely associated with the concept of cure for sleep apnea. Everything sure. wants a cure for sleep apnea. There's very little going on there. We can be the the group that helps to, to, to stimulate that sort of thing. Um, quite frankly, you know, one of the biggest problems we see are with the payers. And, you know, they're the ones who work behind the scenes to help structure reimbursement that determines how clinical practice is set up and, and how interventions are paid for and, and delivered. And, uh, you know, what we have an ongoing uh, project right now where we're working with DMEs and you know some of the things that we're hearing from from the DMEs is is that um, how much should I say, Adam? They just they're 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 very protective of 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 their time, and we need to figure out how can they better serve serve the patients. Some of them, like I've always said in the past, are phenomenal and provide great great service, and some of them, I think. Um, could really improve the, the service that they provide. And I think by having patient focused meetings on a regular basis can really kind of bring that to bear and help us focus as, as an organization on some of the advocacy stuff we can do. Sure. I mean, again, I think if anything, it just gets it out there in the forefront so that, so that people are, you know, maybe willing to take it more seriously and back it yeah. by, you know, research grants, yeah, it, it it definitely the exposure and, and the awareness and the education I think is key is is key and critical. Uh, but I think what we're seeing in the healthcare world and and in the world in general is that it's this is a grassroots bootstrapped world we have to live in, and no one's going to do this for us. It's not in the manufacturer's interest. It's not in the pharmaceuticals interest. It's not in the payers' interest. And it's it's really not in the government's interest. Uh, we're you know eighty percent theoretically undiagnosed, I would say 80% in the healthcare system. They're just, I've walked through different doors or either treating the diabetes or the cardiovascular disease or their mental health or, or, or any of the other cradle to grave comorbidities potentially. Um, but at, at, at the end of the day, you know, if, if building a community like we're doing with sleep health and building a support network, like, like awake is alert, well, and keeping energetic for people that are walking around with excessive daytime sleepiness and providing a, a program like the CPAP assistance program for patients that can't afford their deductible or don't even have enough and don't have insurance. Uh, we're providing these services and we're going to keep building our program because no one else is doing it for our patients and for ourselves. I mean, it's, it's, it's at, at the end of the day, you know, what, What's sad about all the different bottlenecks and infringement points for the patients is that at the end of the day, the patients are not the fourth, they're not the priority as far as the decision maker. It's become a business. And I, we understand that, but we can't afford for the business to get in the way of our health. And that's sort of, you know, that's become our priority. So us as an organization, we're, we're going to be disruptive, but not for disruptive sake. We're providing solutions. So we're, we're looking at the data. We want to see what this wireless consumer data is doing. We want to see what the medical grade data is doing uh, and ha how we can start to really get this technology into our, our not necessarily our, our community's hands, but make it work for them make, let them know they can rely on it. I'm so tired of people telling me they're walking around with their wearable on telling me what stage of sleep they're in. And I, and I said it in the meeting, and I'll re it bears repeating here. These things are have a hard time just getting the steps down right. To think that they're, they're smart enough to figure out the stages of sleep when it takes 27 channels of, of information in an in-lab study is quite honestly insanity. So we have a long ways to go. Yeah. I mean, again, I think when people are out there and they're they're involved in their community, they're hearing stories. You you know, it instills some sort of like the patients can be their best advocate as well. Um, so when they're out there, you know, and, and hearing from different people, and it clicks on them that they're 
you know, going through some sort of symptoms, when they come to meet their doctor or family practitioner, you know, you would hope that they would have better information to be able to advocate for themselves. Yeah, and I, I think that's definitely one of the holes we as an association will start to fill, whether it's our awake curriculum or passing handouts out to patients so that they're informed because, you know, quite honestly, that clinician or that nurse practitioner or that allied healthcare professional, they only have a certain amount of time. They're tired. They've got a cell phone in their pocket. They've got three jobs or whatever it is. They've got other worries. And just because it's a priority to you as the person or the patient walking in the room, it isn't for them. So, you know, armoring our, our community with all the tools no matter what point of the, their, their therapy or their journey they're on is, is crucial. Um, because quite honestly, we all got here, you know, not because of the system, almost really in spite of it. And we're survivors. And so, you know, it's, it's, we want to make sure that people don't have to go through this obstacle course and this, this, you know, it's like watching American Ninja every week. Um, I, I see it replayed every day on, on our forums and in the emails and in the phone calls, people are having the same problems uh, and nobody's listening. Mm -hmm. And so if we as an organization, through, you know, can be the, that advocacy and, and, and be that voice and amplify it and clarify it and, and, and really paint the picture for, for the regulators, for the payers, for, for the society, you know, that's our job. You know, we, we don't want to be here doing this, but no one else is there to do it. So we know that we have to do this. Mm -hmm. I always think too, you know, when I go on the Awake um, Facebook page, it's always, it's quite rewarding when you see people helping other people and sharing their experience. You know, we can chime in, we can give advice too. I mean, we're all, you know, we, we, we're all using the therapy, but it's just really rewarding to see other people reaching out and helping people and sharing experiences. And I think that's, that's really valuable. Yeah, I got. I got to say, coming back to this this meeting and doing a recap on it, the, my most pleasant thing was at the end of the night. I knew that earlier in the day that we had a couple of patients in the back of the room speak, and you know there was a lot going on in the room. I didn't really know who they were, what, where, what world they came from, and they were they were so energized and, and enthralled by the meeting. They stayed around after to hang out and get to know us, and you know we're having dinner and, and, and relaxing. It's been a long couple of months of putting on this meeting and. Turns out not only are they patients, but they're both PhDs and they're computer scientists and they've, you know, been <laughs> wanting to try to break in. I was like, come on, the more the merrier. That's that's yep. that's what we're all about right now. And it was like, oh, that was worth the whole meeting, just that alone. <laughs> so it, it, it was really reaffirming at the end of the night to know, OK, we, we I think something special just happened here. Um, let's all go home, get our rest. And we got a lot of work to do. <laughs> yeah. Good, good networking there, Adam. <laughs> yeah. No, they came, they came to us. So, you know, it wasn't, you know, us trying to sell them. I didn't know who they were, but they were, I guess, feeding off our energy and, and felt that they got a lot out of the meeting. And that was, yeah. it was proof. They stayed around. They wanted to get involved. How can we help? You know? Yeah. But, you know, it actually raises a couple of good points, right? Which is, uh, Patient support and peer support is, is critical. It, it, it's useful in so many different in ways. Yeah. But there's also a downside to it, which is, is the information accurate or tailored yeah. to that specific person? And at APSS, there was actually a really good talk. And one of the, the physicians was talking about CPAP data and telemonitoring. And what he made the point that if you looked at an at a, at a X-ray image, no matter who took it, no matter what healthcare system took it, he could look at it and rely on it. He said if he looked at the sleep study results that was done at a different healthcare system, he didn't know who did it, how it was scored, how the definitions were made, or whether he could rely on the results. And so he'd have to redo it. And I thought that was a really interesting point that our field isn't to the point where you can have a single study that can be truly relied on. Now, that might be an extreme case because a lot of the systems, the home sleep test systems and the PSGs, a lot of them are similar. So then you, it gets at the quality of the scoring and the definitions. And, and even today, there's, there's some different definitions that are used. So there's a lot of variability in, in the system. And I think that's one of the things that we need to, to take advantage, uh, need to improve on as a field. Adam and I were at the FDA conference and, and not to, not to uh, alarm anybody, but I mean, there's still some very basic definitions that aren't agreed upon <laughs> by a lot of people in the sleep apnea field and mm -hmm. in, in the sleep field. And that's of concern too. 
And I think we really need to define some of these things so that we can rely on them a little bit better um, within the professional context, because to the extent that we can rely on them in the professional context, we can do better discussions with, with peer support, if that makes sense. Um, so I think there's, a, there's still a ways, ways for us to go. Yeah, the, the, peer, the peer support is definitely something we want to explore, but we also want to get our peers and our mentors that have the experience, the right training. You know, we, we all wound up on online forums and we're all left our own devices to try to figure it out. And there's a lot of good people out there who know what they're doing. And there's a lot of people that, you know, don't necessarily maybe have a bias or just aren't up to speed enough or cognitively well enough to really be, be in the position to be giving advice. So building up our awake network and identifying who these mentors are going to be and training them is definitely something over the next few years that we want to start to look and identify for um, because there's only one Carl, there's only one Kevin, there's only one of me. And, you know, mm. we, we're, we're a small little organization playing with the big boys as far as the American hearts and American diabetes and the cancer society and, and places like that. And the truth is we really have an overlap with all three of them. So it's, it's, we, we have work to do, but you know, sleep and health, pre sleep health prevention is not a, a sexy moneymaker for, for, for those disease worlds. Um, but we know it's a key component to preventing a lot of it. And mm -hmm. that's, that's, what's going to drive us going forward. Right. Sure. And I'm always a big fan of, you know, whatever message and you're putting out there, it should be always consistent. And, and you, you know, your point, Carol, of like, sometimes people are given advice that maybe you think, ow, oh, you know, maybe I wouldn't do that or try that so it's it's always um good for for those sort of events and, and um comments to be somewhat monitored you know mm -hmm. but i mean if you guys were setting up another meeting for maybe next year would you do anything different <laughs> my, my cat's chiming in i didn't know if you heard her or not <laughs> yeah, I heard. <laughs> I, I, i'm sure she's got an opinion <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll let Carl speak first before I go on that one. What would well, you do different? <laughs> for, for patient focus, this one was really specifically designed to be consistent with other meetings to help FDA understand uh, the, the patient experience and, and the structure was, was, um, was meant on purpose to be consistent with that. I think, um, I think the thing that we would do differently is try to pull out some more of the common experiences in terms of problems and, and barriers and uh, focus on those and then try to pull out solutions. Because I, I think the wisdom of the crowd can be phenomenal. I go back to 22 years ago to that first awake group that I went to, I heard some amazing solutions by patients. I didn't know what a hose head was at the time. And <laughs> someone 22 years ago made a, a device to hold the hose uh, on the bed stand behind them. And I'd never heard of anyone talk about that in a clinical capacity before. And so I think there's solutions that come from, from the folks who are most burdened and, and the most uh, impacted. And I think it, I think it would be important, it, this is just a very general way of talking about it, but not just to talk about the problems, but to say, okay, here are all the problems, what are some solutions, and, and talk about some of the solutions. Sure, and some of those, just like you said, can be, you know, as simple as that, and it just takes some creative person to put it together that, yeah. you know, can be a, a great solution for someone that's struggling. Right, right. And so, Adam, before we wrap up, anything else you'd like to highlight or add? Uh, I would just like that everyone who's watching soccer all day long is actually getting mm -hmm. sleep in between these celebrations <laughs> uh, for, for those in, this, in the states that are enjoy this and for those that are not. Um, it, it obviously plays a role in, in the performance on the field and, and, and how people <laughs> approach the day after. Um, but in all, in all seriousness, I, I just I want to thank our panelists. I want to thank our board members. I want to thank my dog, Trixie, who she makes her a cameo well, appearance yeah. like she did the last time. Yeah. Um, she, yeah. she, that's the sign. She's ready to go to bed. She's got her mask <laughs> right there. Um, it's, it's, it, it was such an, a, a thrilling, invigorating, inspiring meeting uh, that I can't wait to do it again. And I can't wait to, to, to do it larger, broader, 
uh, and not just for the sake of doing it, to know that, that, you know, people that were hearing our message, it wasn't going in one ear out the other. It was, it was the first time that they were really hearing the whole story. And, and, you know, it, it'll be determined whether it went at the other ear and that that's, you know, it's, it's, it sometimes takes hammering home this message a couple of times. So doing it over again, uh, on a national, on a virtual or on a regional basis is definitely, I think in the cards for us. And it might not just be for an FDA audience. It might be for, 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 for CMS, the continuing Medicare services who sets policy for Medicare and Medicaid. It might be for NIH, it might be for CDC. It might be just for the payers. Uh, or it might just be for patients, and maybe we all meet up in in, in Disney World or something, and, and you know, we we talk about what what's you know what sleeps like every year, um, and, and we set the agenda and we create what what the meeting's about, and and, and you know, it's it's. It's proven to be that there, it, you're much better off with the patients, the people in the room than you are without. To design anything in this world without the end user is just pure insanity. Uh, and I don't use that word lightly. No other industry does it. And unfortunately, healthcare, for whatever reasons, um, for whatever established protocols and methods, has, has done that. Uh, and I think the, the way of the word, the way of this technology that we're using right now, just to have a conversation between the three of us, let alone broadcast it over a platform like Facebook, uh, let alone I'll go and put my mask on and, and read my data in real time tomorrow morning. I mean, it, you know, we, we to not be using the, 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 the technology to, to improve the quality of life and our outcomes is just it's it's just not it's not realistic. And it's not practical. This 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 phone is more powerful than 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 what the computers that were in, in the Apollo. And, and that's just if you think about that, that's mind boggling. Mm -hmm. So um, there's no doubt we're going to be able to figure stuff out with this stuff. Uh, we just need to have it in being used for good, not for bad, like we're seeing in the political climate. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Anything you'd like to highlight, Carl, before we leave? Yeah, actually, that's a really good good point is is uh, maybe a series of, of patient focused uh, meetings. But then yeah. ultimately, it's not just to talk among ourselves. It's to talk to payers. It's to talk to CMS. It's to say, how do we come up with a better system? that better serves the needs of the patients. And ultimately that, that's the goal. Uh, we, we're, we are moving away from the use of the term patients in, internally and, and we are using the term end user and we're doing that on purpose. Um, it, it, the end user of the system, we're, we're, we're clients for end users and it really need to be at, at the table no matter whether it's clinical redesign, it's, it's research studies, it's uh, design of, of products or Quite frankly, I think the hardest table to be at is probably the, the payers. And I think ultimately they're the ones who control a lot of what gets done and how it gets done. So I think that's, I think, probably one of our biggest goals coming up. Yeah. Great. Good. Well, I want to thank you both for joining us tonight and uh, sharing your wisdom and your experience during what was a very successful meeting. Um, I'm sure we're all looking forward to hearing some of the results from the survey and, and uh, excited to see what's happening next in, in the, the community. Th thank you so much, Kevin. And uh, maybe next time we could have some of our patient panelists that were on and they can yeah. talk about their experience as well. I'm sure that, 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 that they would like another shot to get it, to finish what they didn't get to say in front of the FDA. I'm sure. Yeah. That would be great. I'd love that. Yeah. Great. So okay, th thank guys. you so much, well, thank guys. You much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.